Welcome to the appendix, where we read the primary sources of the past so that you can better understand the present. Today's primary source, Instructions of the Town of Braintree, Massachusetts, on the Stamp Act, October 14, 1765. These instructions have a particular interest because they were drafted by John Adams and announced his entrance into Massachusetts politics and into the struggle between the colonies and the mother country. The instructions were widely copied throughout Massachusetts. To Ebenezer Thayer, Esquire. Sir, we can no longer forbear complaining that many of the measures of the late ministry and some of the late acts of Parliament have a tendency in our apprehension to divest us of our most essential rights and liberties. We shall confine ourselves, however, chiefly to the Act of Parliament, commonly called the Stamp Act, by which a very burthensome and, in our opinion, unconstitutional tax is to be laid upon us all. And we subjected to numerous and enormous penalties to be prosecuted, sued for, and recovered at the opinion of an informer in a court of admiralty without a jury. We have called this a burthensome tax because the duties are so numerous and so high and the embarrassment to business in this infant, sparsely settled country so great that it would be totally impossible for the people to subsist under it. If we had no controversy at all about the right and authority of imposing it, considering the present scarcity of money, we have reason to think the execution of that act for a short space of time would drain this country of its cash strip multitudes of all their property and reduce them to absolute beggary and what the consequence would be to the peace of the province from so sudden a shock and such a convulsive change in the whole course of our business and substance we tremble to consider. We further apprehend this tax to be unconstitutional. We have always understood it to be a grand and fundamental principle of the Constitution, that no freeman shall be subject to any tax to which he has not given his own consent, in person or by proxy. And the maxims of the law, as we have consistently received them, are to be the same effect, that no freeman can be separated from his property but by his own act or fault. We take it clearly, therefore, to be inconsistent with the spirit of the common law and of the essential fundamental purposes of the British Constitution that we should be subject to any tax imposed by the British Parliament, because we are not represented in that assembly in any sense, unless it be by a fiction of law, as insensible in theory as it would be injurious in practice, if such a taxation should be grounded on it. But the most grievous innovation of all is the alarming extension of the power of courts of admiralty. In these courts, no judge presides alone. No juries have any concern there. The law and the fact are both to be decided by the same single judge whose commission is only during pleasure and with whom, as we are told, the most mischievous of all customs has been established, that of taking commissions on all condemnations, so that he is under pecuniary temptation, always against the subject. We have all along thought the act of trade in this respect a grievance, but the Stamp Act has opened a vast number of sources of new crimes which may be committed by any man and cannot but be committed by multitudes and prodigious penalties are annexed, and all these are to be tried by such a judge of such a court. We cannot help asserting, therefore, 
that this part of the Act will make an essential change in the constitution of juries, and it's directly repugnant to the great charter itself, for by that charter no Americament shall be assessed, but by the oath of honest and lawful men of the vicinage, and no freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his freehold or liberties of free customs, nor passed upon, nor contaminated, nor condemned, but by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land, so that this act will make such a distinction and create such a difference between them. The subjects in Great Britain and those in America, as we could not have expected from the guardians of liberty in both. As these, sir, are our sentiments of this act, we, the freeholders and other inhabitants legally assembled for this purpose, must enjoin it upon you to comply with no measures or proposals for countenancing the same or asserting in the execution of it but by all lawful means, consent with our allegiance to the king and relation to Great Britain to oppose the execution of it till we can hear the success of the cries and petitions of America for relief. We further recommend the most clear and explicit assertion and vindication of our rights and liberties to be entered on the public record that the world may know in the present and all future generations that we have a clear knowledge and a just sense of them and with submission to divine providence that we never can be slaves. Thank you for joining us for our primary source today on the appendix. We will see you in the stacks.